This is big. Last week, at the time of this recording, big news would come to the MMA world as a long-standing case against the UFC would be granted class certification, meaning every UFC fighter from the period of the end of 2010 to the middle of 2017 can now sue the UFC for alleged unfair business practices and the plaintiffs are seeking $800 million to $1.6 billion in damages. This was actually a lawsuit I referenced in my boxing versus UFC fighter pay video that I didn't think would make a dent in the UFC until now. Essentially, former UFC fighters such as John Fitch, Kung Lee, and more claimed that the UFC was a monopoly and because of their dominant place in the MMA market, made themselves practically the only place MMA fighters could continue their career. And because of this dependency, the UFC could get away with paying their fighters with such low compensation. Now, obviously, the UFC is planning to appeal this decision, but in the meantime, if this decision remains standing, this could mean a lot to the MMA world. And today, we're going to talk about how this can completely shift the dynamic of the sport and the position of the UFC in it. But before we begin, let's talk about something that will completely shift your health and time as well. So as many of you guys know, I'm a very active boy and I like to box a lot and I like to stay in shape in general. To do so, not only do I have to train my body correctly, most importantly, I gotta eat and fuel my body correctly too. I usually meal prep in the beginning of the week and this can take several hours and give me a headache and is not a great way to start the week. With Factor 75, they cut out the stressful meal planning and extensive prepping so meals can come together in minutes, taking the guesswork out of what you wanna make for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Additionally, Factor makes it possible for you to achieve your daily goals through nutritious ingredients and is dietitian approved. With meal preference options like keto, calorie smart, and vegan and vegetarian, and more than 27 meal options each week, there's something for everyone. Meal plans range from 14 to 18 meals per week, and you can add more or reduce the number depending on your specific needs. You can easily modify food preferences and skip a week if needed. So thanks, Factor75, for sponsoring today's video. Please go to this link and use code P-O-G-T-J-LOVES-A-U-G-50 for 50% off your first box, or you can scan the QR code with your phone. Again, thank you, Factor75, for sponsoring today's video. As it stands, the UFC has been the gold standard for MMA and has been the long-standing top dog amongst all other MMA promotions, but with this status comes compensation, or lack thereof for fighters. It's long been known that fighters in the UFC are paid much less than other fighters or even other professional athletes in other sports organizations, despite the UFC making as much, if not more, than these other organizations. While the UFC only pays their athletes about 17-18% to 18 of their revenue when in comparison, most other sports organizations pay their athletes about half of their total revenue, making the UFC one of the lowest, if not the lowest, athlete paying professional sports organization relative to how much they make. Even worse, back in 2015, the UFC made one of the worst deals of all time in the Reebok deal which made Reebok the sole brand for athletes to wear and took away brand deals worth tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars for these fighters. Now if you couple this with quote restrictive contracts that essentially control fighters from being anything but completely obedient to the UFC, well now you have a solid case for why a lawsuit like this now has class certification. So let's talk about these contracts because in my opinion, fighters contracts in the UFC is why they remain on top and will be central to this video. Through both the Francis Ngannou contract debacle and also Eddie Alvarez's contract that was revealed through this very lawsuit, we can see some of the restrictiveness of these contracts. Firstly and most importantly as brought up by Francis is that every UFC fighter is technically an independent contractor and not an employee of the UFC. Now note the word technically. A real independent contractor is supposed to be their own boss as in set their own hours, be in control of how they provide the goods and services, set their own rates and availability, etc, etc. But again, with no real competition for these fighters to go to, a lot of the pros of being an independent contractor go out the window because there's no real competing contracts to sign, meaning these independent contractors are heavily dependent on the UFC to pay them. So let's talk about the cons of being an independent contractor and how the UFC benefits from that. And speaking of benefits, UFC fighters, because they are independent contractors have none. They have no medical insurance, 
no federal benefits like paid leave, no 401ks, or anything a regular employee would benefit from. And most importantly, because again, they are independent contractors, UFC fighters can't form unions and can't really benefit as much from a union if they join, meaning it's practically impossible for these UFC fighters to come together and strike and fight for better wages or benefits. And if we go onward, the UFC has non-compete and right to match clauses. These clauses in UFC fighters' contracts are the key in really keeping fighters tied to the UFC. The non-compete clause states that for a time after a fighter's contract is up, a fighter cannot sign to another promotion with this time ranging from a couple months up to a year. In this period, the UFC has the right to match any offers given to that fighter from other promotions. And because the UFC has the right to know the exact details of these offers, the UFC can usually just beat out whatever those other promotions were offering. And lastly, the UFC also has a more binding clause for champions often called the champ clause. The champ clause automatically re-signs a fighter to the UFC after every fight so long as they remain the champion and usually this re-signs that champ to one to three years after their last fight. This clause is meant to prevent champions from using their leverage as champ to test the free market and force a much better contract with the UFC or a competing promotion. We actually saw this exact scenario with Francis Ngannou as he waited almost an exact year after he defended his belt against Cyril Gan, which is the amount of time his champ clause extended him. And after that year was up, he decided not to re-sign with the UFC even though he was offered a new $8 million contract in this period by the UFC to stay with the promotion. So with these contracts, the UFC can continue to re-sign the top talent and keep themselves on top. And because the UFC is on top, the top talent will continue to sign to the UFC. And as you may know, this cycle has continued to work for a very long time. But with this lawsuit, this can change everything. According to Bloody Elbow, the court case centers around these restrictive contracts that I detailed previously, and the court actually found these contracts, quote, with their various restrictive clauses, existed through out the class period and operated to lock up fighters with Zufa, which is the parent company of the UFC. These contracts therefore restricted fighter mobility and allowed Zufa to build concentrated power in the market for fighter services. I mean, everybody is talking about the billions of dollars fighters will probably get in compensation and through lawsuits, which is probably really, really big. But what's more important, at least in sport, is that the courts have recognized these contracts as unfair and is likely to change or even abolish the current set of clauses altogether. This means the classification of independent contractors, non-compete and match clauses, and the champ clause could all go away. And this is the point I finally wanted to get to. This means it will be vastly easier for other MMA promotions to compete and sign the top talent. We all know the top talent in the MMA world is in the UFC, and it was because of these restrictive contracts. But without the non-compete and match clauses, fighters no longer have to wait months for the UFC to give them an offer. They can just take a good offer from another competing promotion immediately after their last fight in their contract. But this is absolutely monumental for champions as after they have attained the belt, their stock is through the roof, meaning other promotions have the potential of picking up arguably the best fighter in the world at that weight class, forcing the UFC's hand to either pay their champions a shitload of money or have their champ walk away at the top, meaning we are bound to see more Francis Ngannou situations because champions can pretty much leave the promotion and start fighting to make money and not have to wait out a year to three years in uncertainty like Francis Ngannou did. Imagine a world where the PFL, Bellator, and other promotions can actually make fights just as big as the UFC. Recently, Derek Lewis re-signed with the UFC for eight more fights, but imagine without the non-compete and match clause, the PFL could have easily offered Derek Lewis more money and Derek Lewis could have immediately been set up for another fight against Francis Ngannou, which could have been probably much better than the snooze fest they put up in their first. But this is a lot of speculation and looking far ahead. Right now, what's happening is that the UFC is appealing this decision. And because of the appeals process in the United States, this could take several years or even over a decade for anything to happen. I mean, it took the courts almost a decade to get this case class certification. So imagine a whole team of UFC lawyers trying to get the appeal. This is going to take a very, very long time. 
though in the meantime the ufc can continue to operate like usual and have all the money and the time to come up with something i've seen some people saying that the ufc could settle with fighters and i've seen numbers go up all the way to five billion dollars now that seems like a big number because well it is but this may be a relatively small price to pay for the ufc to stay on top as this could pay off the plaintiffs and all of the UFC fighters that were damaged in the time period I was talking about before, and this could also mean no reforms to contracts or any other unfair business practices and business as usual for Dana White and the UFC. So what do you guys think about this monumental case against the UFC? In my opinion, like I demonstrated in this video, this could mean a lot for the world of MMA and can finally topple the UFC as the top dog. Though, realistically, the UFC is going to peel the shit out of this case and probably elongate this whole process. Though, again, I still want to hear your guys' thoughts. Anyways, thank you guys for always supporting. Peace.